the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We talked about the talks that are happening right now between de several denominations concerning the unity of the church. And uh, I will continue on that theme uh, by saying that uh, the difficulties in these talks are happening mainly with the Catholic Church for more than one reason. The differences in doctrine between Catholic and Orthodox are many. As in the Catholic Church, since the uh, schism of 1054, many other doctrines were uh, taken up by the Catholic Church that were not acceptable to the Orthodox world. And uh, also, until today, uh, they're not stopping uh, any development of new doctrine, but actually, uh, as recent as the late Pope John Paul II, uh, some new doctrines came uh, out to light, and that caused even a larger rift between Orthodoxy and Christianity. To give you an idea, after the issues of the filioque, changing the creed, and the primacy and supremacy insisting on the uh, Pope of Rome to be the supreme head of the church, uh, the issues that separated Constantinople and Rome in the 11th century. Since then, many other uh, issues came about or new doctrines on the part of the Catholic Church. Uh, not the least of them is the issue of purgatory, which uh, invents a new place other than paradise uh, or Hades as a waiting place uh, before the coming of Christ. Uh, a place in which uh, people would suffer uh, for sins that they've committed but not confessed until they are allowed uh, to go to paradise because of the fact that they would have expiated their sins in the fire of the purgatory. We cannot accept this one, of course, because we believe that only the blood of Christ can erase our sins. If we say that any other suffering on our part or any other torture that we can endure can expiate our sins, then it is as if we saying that we do not need Christ. Plus that there is no reference whatsoever directly or indirectly to such a place uh, in the uh, Bible or in the teachings of the fathers. And just to illustrate how difficult the unity talks are when we talk about these things, let me give you an example. I was told by uh, sources that attended that meeting that there was a meeting that took place in 1994, April 1994, in the monastery of St. Bishoy in Egypt, uh, invited by Pope Shenouda III, uh, talks between the Catholic Church and the uh, uh, Oriental Orthodox Churches represented by the Coptic Church about the issue of purgatory alone. A very high level uh, delegation came from Rome and a high level delegation also uh, from the Coptic Church headed by Metropolitan Bishoy, uh, the Secretary of the Holy Synod, and uh, these talks lasted for about four days. In the first three days, all kinds of paper were exchanged and read from both sides. And at the end of all these discussions, everybody came to the conclusion individually and group-wise that there is no purgatory. Every single individual around that table was convinced that the doctrine of purgatory is not correct. Yet when Metropolitan Bishoy asked for uh, the meeting to sign a protocol of agreement uh, as to the finding of the meeting, the delegation from Rome refused, saying that because uh, this doctrine was pronounced by an infallible pope, uh, nobody can uh, reverse it, not even the current pope, otherwise he would be denying his own infallibility if he denies the infallibility of his predecessors. 
So basically we need the Catholic Church to resolve first that wrong doctrine of infallibility of the Pope of Rome in order for anything to proceed and for anything to be agreed upon and signed uh, as a result of these talks. As uh, another example, the Immaculate Conception of St. Mary. The Catholics themselves had a very hard time uh, with this doctrine. It was almost going to divide the Catholic Church for five centuries. It was debated the pros and cons, those who are pro-Immaculate Conception and those who are against the Immaculate Conception until one pope came from the camp that believed in the Immaculate Conception and uh, so to say uh, three children saw an apparition of Virgin Mary telling them that she was the Immaculate Conception and uh, that particular pope being infallible when he declared the doctrine of Immaculate Conception it became a doctrine in the Catholic Church and that issue that doctrine really says that St. Mary herself was conceived of in the womb of her mother, St. Anna, without the original sin. She was immaculate since her conception. We cannot accept as Orthodox such a claim. We do venerate Our Lady the Virgin Mary above all the saints, even above all the angels and archangels, but we cannot attribute to her that, uh, that fact uh, or that uh, theory in the Catholic Church that is, she is immaculate conception because if any human being would have been uh, born or conceived of without the original sin, uh, without Christ having paid uh, the price on the cross, then we don't need Christ. And actually it means also that we don't need her, Virgin Mary, to give birth to him. So trying to elevate her, they really diminished her value. And who says that that apparition is an apparition of St. Mary? If you read the rest of uh, the proceedings uh, or the uh, notes that were written about these apparitions and what she supposedly said to uh, the uh, three children, you would be convinced that this is not an apparition at all of St. Mary and it's probably uh, or most certainly a satanic apparition uh, that delivered such a message uh, among other messages like if you do not pray the rosary in a certain way praying ten times to the Virgin and once only to God uh, you are threatened by her uh, to suffer in the fire of purgatory we do not know our mother Virgin Mary as someone that would threaten the believers uh, if they don't pray to her more than they pray to God. And that is why the rosary is not acceptable in the Orthodox Church. It is a teaching that came about from that so-called apparition uh, and has no basic, ba basic requirement in tradition or in the Church uh, Fathers uh, or in the Bible. Uh, as I said, uh, even at the time of uh, John, uh, Pope John Paul II, the late Pope, uh, other doctrines developed like the one that he pronounced in 1995 concerning the salvation of non-believers. According to that one, uh, even non-Christians who are not baptized can be saved. Uh, and he states that uh, the Logos of God could have come not only in the person of Jesus Christ for the Christians, but in the persons of certain prophets for other uh, uh, religions uh, or uh, uh, spiritual heads of, uh, of these churches like Buddha and uh, Shiva and so on and so forth could have been a, a manifestation of the Logos of God, which we of course cannot accept at all. The Bible is very strict on this matter uh, th this who believes and is baptized is saved and also Christ saying in John 3 5 if you are not born of water and spirit uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of God we have to uh, go back to the Bible 
and we have to go back to the scriptures and we have to go back to uh, the sayings of the fathers and the tradition of the church to stay in line and to stay in the orthodoxy of the, of the teaching of the church. We cannot allow uh, that such new inventions happen just because uh, we w would want to uh, be in uh, in good relationships with the world around us. Uh, Saint Athanasius, our 20th Pope, uh, when they told him the whole world is against you, Athanasius, and he, he said and replied, and I am against the world, and glory be to God forever. Amen.